There's a life that you were designed and created to live. It's a life of purpose. It's a life of adventure. It's a life of fulfillment. And that's the life that you were created and designed to live. And some of you, maybe you hear that this morning and you say, well, Jeff, if I were... If I were created for that, if I was planned for that, if that's what I was supposed to live, then, then why am I not living it? Well, thinking about that question made me think about middle school. How many of y'all wish you could go back to middle school? Ain't nary a hand being raised in the whole place, right? And those middle school days, man, you can make one bad decision. Y'all all know somebody that got caught picking their nose in middle school, and they lived with that thing for years to come, didn't they, right? You get called, man, and that thing gets stuck on you. But in the real world, in real life, some of us have gotten caught doing some things. And that thing that we did or that thing that was done to us, it became like a prison to us. It became like a prison to us that, 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 that we just haven't known how to get out of. And so as adults, many of us, maybe you, many of us live in this captivity, this prison. It's not physical bars, physical walls, but it's an emotional prison, a spiritual prison, and it's a prison that keeps me in bondage based on two things. One is what I did. That's my identity. I did a thing, and now that, in some way, has become my identity. Can you identify with that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I did a thing, and it became my identity. The other thing is what I do to make up for the thing that I did. So many people spend so much time in our lives trying to make this penance thing, make things up, make things better, fix things because of what I did. Well, what if I told you today that if you're living that life of, of, of I'm bound by my identity, I'm imprisoned by I'll never be good enough, I'll never be able to do enough to fix it. What if I told you today that you could be free from both of those things? God wants some people to hear that this morning. Um, he wants to free you from both of those things. Every morning, these days, every morning, when I wake up, um, there is something that's waiting on me every morning when I wake up. I get up, I put my shoes on, and I walk down the hall, and there's a crate that has our little dog, Blue, which ain't so little anymore. Blue is not a puppy. She's growing up. Blue is in that crate, and she's in there, and she's been asleep, but when she hears me coming down the hall, she's ready to get out of there. Now, she's ready to go. How many of y'all know when that puppy's in that crate, man, there is not another person on the earth who's so glad to see you as that dog is. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I walk up to that joke of man, and she starts giving that tail. I mean, she is wagging that tail, doing a little one of these numbers. She is so happy to see me. Man, she putting her nose up against that crate trying to get out of there, and she knows that she can do everything under the sun, but she can't get out of that crate. But guess who can? I can. And I want to get her out of that crate. I want to get her out of that crate because it does something in my heart to see that, that she's in there and she can't get out on her own. And so I want to get her out so that she doesn't have to spend more time in captivity. I open that crate, she comes running out, and she is free. You have a heavenly Father that looks into your life right now and He sees how you are inside this crate of your life, this cage, you can't get out of it. You can't get out of it and there's nothing you can do. You can, you can try to be a good, a good doggy. Right? Blue can be in that crate and she can know that, well, if I just don't be loud and wake them up, if I don't just scratch all over the thing, if I don't chew up all of my toys, maybe they'll let me, maybe they'll, maybe they'll let me out. But really, what she can't understand is that I want her out of the crate. And your father wants you out of the cage that has become your identity because of the thing that you've done, because of what they said about you, because of past seasons. He wants you to live in freedom. And that's where we're going this morning. Your life is about more than just finding freedom. There is a, a freedom that's going to produce things in your life. And so if you have an outline this morning, the title of our message is Fruit That Flows from Freedom. 
fruit that flows from freedom. It's got to come from somewhere. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going we're to talk about how can I experience a freedom. And I'm excited about talking to you this morning in some theological terms. Now, I love telling stories about my dog and my kids and my past, but what I really love to do is to take you all to the Scriptures and say, look at what God is saying to you. So we're going to go into Galatians chapter 5 this morning. We're going to cruise right down through this thing. If you've got an outline, I want you to write this down. My freedom comes from what Christ did, not what I do. Now that's a word right there that will set some people free when you take hold of it. My freedom comes from what Christ did, not what I do. I'll explain in a moment. Look at Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4. Paul, writing to the church at Galatians, says, So Christ has truly set us free. Now remember, we're talking in this series about the Holy Spirit. Why are we talking about Jesus? Because it's Jesus. He's the one who set us free. Look at what he says. Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. What does he mean by that? Well, he's going to tell you. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Now when he mentions the law, if you're not familiar with this term, this is the, the Mosaic law. This is the, the law that God gave to Moses when he set the people uh, of Israel free from Egypt. Old Testament, God gives Moses 613 or so laws. It's written in the first five books of the, of the Old Testament. And God gave them these laws because the time had not yet come for the once and only sacrifice that would come and pay the price for their sins. And so this law was a system of telling people, these are the ways that you live your life. If you will do these things, God will be pleased with you. Some of us here today are stuck in a mentality that was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross, was resurrected, and the Holy Spirit came to us. We, some of us are still living as if God is pleased in us because of our ability to not bark too loudly, not scratch the floor too much, or not tear up our toy. Are you tracking with me? Yes. That's not what Jesus came to do. He came to set us truly free. Amen. Verse 2, listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If, everybody say if. Yes. That's a big word. In other words, there are some things hanging on a decision. If, you're counting on circumcision. Stop, 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 stop. Can we talk about that just a minute? Y'all are like, no, we really don't want to, Jeff. It's Sunday, and it's morning, and I don't want to talk about being circumcised. <laughs> well, we're going to anyway. And I don't want to be crass with this. I really don't. Circumcision in the Old Testament is a picture of a cutting away of the flesh. A physical cutting away of the flesh. And it's a sign that God, for whatever reason, why God chose this as the sign to give to Abraham, I guess you can ask him when you get your cloud and your harp and, and all of that stuff. But, 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 but circumcision is a cutting away of the flesh. And for a lot of us, man, um, we, we look at that covenant that God made with Abraham and God said, if you will be circumcised, if your children, your sons will be circumcised, then when I look at them, I'll see them as my children. In other words, there's something that, that these people in the Old Testament had to do. Paul says, if you're looking... Now, now, now listen, I want you to get this. Because this is what all of New Testament faith hinges on. Paul is saying to these people, this church, this new church in Galatia, if you are counting on anything that you do to bring pleasure to God... You are missing the point. He says if you're counting on circumcision, you could say that you could, you could substitute maybe if you're counting on church attendance, if you're counting on the amount of money you're giving, if you're counting on anything that you're doing to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. Why did Paul say that? Because if we could do it on our own, if we could be good enough, be perfect, and not need a Savior. If we could do it on our own, we wouldn't need Jesus, would we? But how many of y'all know, we can't do it on our own. Have you ever tried to start off a new week and say, I'm going to be good this week. I'm not going to Starbucks and spend the money I don't need to. I'm not going to cuss when I hit my finger with a hammer. I'm not going to reach back and swing at the rotten kids in the minivan. Right? I'm going to be good. How long did that last for you? Right, exactly. 
Mm. Then Christ will be of no benefit. He says, I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole 613 laws that Moses wrote in the first five, and you can't do it. And it says in verse 4, if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off. And I like that phrase because he was just talking about circumcision. Circumcision is a cutting way of the flesh as if I could stop my own sinful desires. We've all tried, but we haven't been able to do it. Circumcision says stop doing the things you're not supposed to. Start doing the things that you, that you are supposed to do. But when you're leaning into that law-based living, you're cutting yourself off from Christ. What? Yes. Paul says when you're living that way, you have fallen away from God's grace. Now, I don't think y'all hear what I'm saying today because this is not a message that is often preached and it's not preached clearly enough in the church. We want to drag things from the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. We want to drag things from all of that and put it into the New Testament and say, well, I've got to do these things and I can't do those things and I'm going to follow Jesus. And I'm just telling you this morning, what Paul writes consistently throughout the Gospels is quit trying to live out the law. Quit trying to be perfect. Quit trying to be good enough and focus your eyes on what Jesus already did. Amen. Focus your eyes on what Jesus did. My freedom comes from what Christ did, not what I do. You want to experience freedom? You want out of the crate? Quit worrying so much about not scratching, not tearing up, not barking. And start getting your eyes on the one who's coming down the hall and has the ability to unlock your cage and let you out because he wants to let you out. What happens when he does that? Well, this is an amazing thing. But when God sets us free, when Jesus paid the price and he offers it to us and we accept his offer, his sacrifice, we become free. And being free from the law, write this down, allows me to focus on love. Being free from the law allows me to focus on love. Just think about that statement for a moment. If your whole interaction with God, if your whole idea of going to church, like so many people that come to church or don't go to church, have this idea that church is about a system of rules. If I start going to church, they're going to tell me I've got to start living this way and I've got to stop doing these things and I've got to hang around these people and stop hanging around those people. And that's not what it is at all. What we're going to see in the Scripture is that when we set ourselves free and we climb out of the cave and we're no longer bound by the crate of the law which, which holds us in our identity that I can't, I can't be good enough, that's how those people knew me, I made mistakes back there. The freedom in Christ says I don't have to be good enough. I don't have to be perfect. The law says be perfect. Grace says you're good enough just as you are. Amen. God loves you, warts and pimples and all. Amen. Come on, somebody. I like that. <laughs> so if, I, if, I, if I'm set free, and now I've got an opportunity to do something, I don't have to use all of that time. Like, like, does anybody besides me just get worn out from trying to be good enough, man? You ever feel yes. that way? Amen. Y'all ever watch the drummers back here when they're playing the drums? Have y'all ever sat down behind a drum kit, like actually sat down and tried to do what they do? I mean, it's like, okay, let's count one, two, three, four with my mind. Let's get my left foot doing something, my right foot doing something, my other hand. How in the world am I supposed to do this? I have sat down back there, and it sounds like it sounds like the, 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 the bell's about to ring, like the roof's about to ring. You hush your mouth right now. I have got rhythm, Miss Boomer lady. <laughs> That's what keeping the law is like. It's trying to keep all of it going, and it's impossible. When we're able to stop thinking and spending all of our time and emotion and energy and waking up thinking, oh, i got to be good today, going to bed at night, God, please forgive me for all the things that I did. Do you realize He already forgave you at the cross? That's done. So, so what do I do with all this free time that I have? Look at verses 13 through 15. You have been called to live in freedom. My brothers and sisters, you've been called to live in freedom. Get out of the cage. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. What do you mean by that? Oh, okay. So God has forgiven me. I've been forgiven. I can do whatever I want to. I can go have fun. God's already forgiven me. I believe in Jesus. So I can just go live however I want to. 
No, that's not how it works. He says instead, <clears throat> use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. All 613 of those laws are leading to this place of, of loving God and loving people. But the problem is we can't satisfy the requirements of the law because we're not good enough. Verse 15, but if you are always biting and always devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. Does that, ha does that happen in the church of Jesus Christ? Do Christians bite and devour one another? Are we slow to forgive and quick to gossip and quick to be angry with one another? Mm. Being free from the law allows me to focus on love. How much, how much of a difference in the world could you make, man, if you, if you, if you, if you stopped looking back and what you did, and what they said about you, and who you were, and you get out of the crate, and you start looking up, stop looking back, start looking up, say, Jesus, He loves me. He is for me. Yes. How could you live that way? If Jesus really is for me, then, then He puts people in front of me. If I'm bold enough to step in front of them and just love on them and hug on them and listen to them and, and, and be there for them, be empathetic towards them, is God not going to bless that and give me a great joy in my life? That's the point of freedom. So, God wants you to live a life that's focused on loving other people. But we live as if it's up to us to pay for our own sins, don't we? That's the way we live sometimes. But Jesus paid for our sins and He sent the Holy Spirit to live in us. Next thing, Christ paid for my freedom. The Holy Spirit guides me in freedom. Do you understand that? Christ paid for my freedom and now when I accept His sacrifice, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in me. Look at verses 16 through 18. Paul says, So I say let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Come on, somebody. Wouldn't that be yes. a joyful day? Yes. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Man, these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you're directed by the Spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses. So the, the, the sin nature, the flesh nature, the, this nature that we have is always going to be drawn towards things that are going to put me in the center of my life. Things that are going to make me feel good. The things that are going to make people say good things about me. And I'm always going to be drawn to that. But when the Spirit of God lives in you, what does He say? He says those who are first will become last. The last will become first. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Serve other people. Put others before yourself. That's what he's saying. Christ paid for my freedom, but the Holy Spirit guides me in freedom. It's like, it's like going down the highway. And you get on the highway and you, you've got a destination of that's where I'm going to go. Your car is the vehicle of your life. The highway is the plan that God has for you. I don't know about y'all, but I can be going from here to Rutherfordton, North Carolina, where my family lives. Let there be a sheet on the side of the road. I am going to have to get off on that sheet. Get me two Reese, PC, whatever those things are. Dive Mountain Dew. GPS lady going nuts. Rerouting. Rerouted, right? The Holy Spirit living inside of you says, Hey, I know you want that Reese cup and that Diet Mountain Dew, but we're trying to go this way. Can we get back on the track and go to where we're trying to go? That's what He does in your life. And when you're a follower of Jesus, this is good news, man. You don't have to be perfect to be a follower of Jesus. You don't have to be perfect. You're going to make bad decisions. You're going to sin. You're going to mess up. And the Holy Spirit is going to start peeing your heart. And He's going to start letting you know that, hey, you're not supposed to be in sheets right now. You're supposed to be on our 40. Get back on our 40. Because the plan is to go from here to there. And there is where we're trying to get to. But we can't get there if we keep going to His house. And we can't get there if we keep going to that place. We can't get there if we keep doing that thing. So get away from that thing and get on the road. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. He wants to guide us like an internal GPS. The problem with that 
Now, I don't know about y'all because I don't have to live inside of your dome, but the problem with me is there are sinful desires that live up here. And they are strong and they are constant. And I want you to get this, man. Your own desires, my very own desires, will lead me to destruction. God's plan for you is to prosper you. God's plan for you is to move you forward into a life where you're constantly, He's pouring into you, it's flowing out of you, and you're a blessing to other people. The problem is our own desires, the same way that God wants to bless us, you have an enemy, Satan himself wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you and he knows which buttons to push to get you all janky and messed up. Look at verse 19. <clears throat> when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, it's not your neighbors, nobody else made you do it. It's your sinful nature. It's my sinful nature. When I mess up and go sideways and do things wrong, it's because of evil that lives inside of me. The only good thing in me is Jesus, and he makes, he makes the difference where I can't be enough. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry. That's not just some little fat Buddha baby that's on a shelf, right? <laughs> idolatry can be, can be a job that I want, and I think if I can get to that job, then I'm, I'm finally will have made it. They'll see something in me that they didn't see. They're, they're going to they're gonna think I'm a big deal. That job is going to give me that money that's going to allow me to buy that thing, and all of the time it's taking you away from God, and that idolatry is the enemy using things to separate you. Sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, Selfish ambition and my opinion on anybody here besides myself, man. I struggle with all these things. I don't know about you, but man, they show up in my life too. Dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Did you hear what he said? Anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, Jeff, I thought you just told me if I believed in Jesus that, 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 that He would forgive me of my sins. I didn't say if you believe in Jesus. The demons believe in Jesus and they shudder. Oh. Jesus said, give me your life. Die to your old self. Follow me. Doesn't mean that you're going to live a perfect life, but, but the people who, who live that sort of life, that's not a, a, an occasion that happens once in a while. The, the people who are characterized in this passage of Scripture are people who have said, I'm going to throw myself 100% into whatever makes me feel good, into whatever I want to do, into whatever makes me a big deal. I'm not going to follow Jesus. I'm not going to deny myself. And God says, if you will not, Accept my son Jesus if you will not turn away from your old life and follow me. All I can do for you is all that Jesus did and that's all that's needed. But if you won't accept Jesus, there is no way for you. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father by being a good person. No one comes to the Father by doing more good than they do bad. No one comes to the Father except through denying yourself, dying to yourself, and following Jesus. And that's a very clear statement that Paul is making right there. I just got to ask you this. You've got those sinful desires. I have those sinful desires. Have you ever looked back on your life and thought, wow, that thing that I did, boy, that sure did produce a lot of good things in my life. Or do we look back at those days in our life and think, my goodness, if I could have those days and those opportunities to make those decisions again, I could have made so much more with it. Amen. He's saying to us, get away from those things. Yes. Now, you say, Jeff, I've tried. A thousand times I've said, God, I'll never go there again. A thousand times ah. I've gone back there. Yeah. And a thousand and one times I've felt guilty and I can't break it loose. But he tells us that the Spirit of God has divine power for tearing down, breaking down, dunamis, blowing up strongholds of every kind. And it's the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit that can even change your desires. Look at verses 22 and 23. He says, but the Holy Spirit 
produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Now stop right there. All y'all Sunday school people know that list real good is coming up next. But I don't want to just run past this. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Fruit is such an interesting word, isn't it? What do you think about when you think about fruit? Bananas, oranges, apples, those kinds of things. Well, where do those things come from? Fruit doesn't just show up. Uh, fruit doesn't just come from itself. It comes from somewhere. Fruit come from a bud that came from a stalk that came from a seed that was in the ground. The scripture says unless a kernel of wheat dies and falls to the ground, it can never produce fruit. In the same way, in your life, if you're going to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, let me rephrase that. If the Holy Spirit is going to produce the kind of fruit that He planned for your life, there has to be a death that takes place. Yes. You take that seed, that kernel of wheat, and you put it into good soil. And you pour rain onto it. And you pour sunshine onto it. And you, you might even put a little cow manure. Come on, somebody. Put some stanky stuff in your life. Anybody? God ever used any stanky stuff in your life to grow something? Huh? Put all of that on it. And that seed that was dead begins to come to life. And that's what he's trying to do in some of your lives right now. The stanky mess that's sitting right on top of you is something that was put there on purpose to help you to grow, man. But man, that seed that was dead, when all the conditions are right, guess what happens? David said this last night, you can take a kernel of corn and lay it on the table and it's dead as a hammer. It's never going to become something else. But when you put it inside the right soil, something supernatural begins to take place. When your life gets planted in the soil of the gospel, a soil that says, I'm not enough, I can't be enough, Jesus, I need you, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior, I give you my life, I'll follow you, I'll go where you want me to go, whatever, whenever, however, Jesus, I belong to you. That thing begins to grow and start popping through some hard soil. It starts to pop out leaves. It starts to pop out buds. And what does it look like? It says the Holy Spirit will produce love. Yes. Caring more about the other person than I care about myself. I love it. No, I don't. I ain't even going to say that lie. I do not love a Hallmark movie. <laughs> all that Hollywood stuff. I mean, but you see all this Hollywood stuff. <laughs> My man trying to get that girl because she's fine. And if he gets her, they know that he never should have had her. And they're going to think he's a big deal. And we never saw that little old somebody could get with her. And it's all about how he's going to feel. But Christian love is caring more about the other person. Let me tell you all something right now. Christian love will cost you. Yes. It will cost you. And you don't have it in yourself to do that. But the Holy Spirit living in your life will cause you to see somebody that's in need. And instead of running away from it, it will bring something out of you, Jackie Lynch, where before you know it, you are giving away a shirt, giving away money, you're giving away time, you're giving away all kinds of things. And love turns into joy because when, when, I, when, when I glorify God by the love that I show to other people, come on, now stay with me. When I glorify God, that's the thing that He created me for. And so I'm, I'm glorifying Him and He returns joy into my life. And that gives me peace. What's peace? Shalom. Old Testament word, shalom is not the absence of conflict. Shalom, think the Garden of Eden, perfection. Everything was perfect. You're not going to live in a perfect world in this life, but He can bring shalom to your mind. Patience. Now, if y'all need patience, just come work with me for a week. I'll show y'all how to do it. I got this one nailed. If you don't believe me, just ask that woman that was four cars ahead of me at that little off-ramp at Lowe's Trace when I got the thing on that floor. Go, woman, go! We're all going to get run over the back here. We're going to get killed. you got to go! Just as patient as I can be. Don't y'all even worry about it. Jesus, I need you now. Yes, I do. He says it will produce kindness in us. A kind word turns away wrath. Huh? He'll produce goodness. He'll produce faithfulness. Man, 
You get close to God and start living for Him. You used to worry about does God love me? Is God for me? You get your eyes right on Him and that faithfulness thing, you're going to be stuck like there's some gorilla glue on you to Jesus. You don't even want to turn and go to those places you want. I mean, you're going to be crazy talking about, I can't wait to get to church on Sunday, right? That's how He changes our desires. Gentleness, self-control. And then He says there's no law against these things. You are not going to go to any country on the face of this earth and they're going to tell you we're throwing you in jail because you were too patient with somebody today. <laughs> what he said. There's no law against these things. Why is all that so important? Because he can change our nature. And our nature is going to be outrageous and sexual impurity and lust and greed and all of these things. We get it, man. We're all, we're all just people here. You ain't no different than anybody else. We all got that same junk going on. The preacher struggles with it too. Come on, somebody. Don't look at me like you're all crazy in the eyeballs. But Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough that He will change our desire. And the last thing is the life that God planned for me is made possible by the Spirit. Verse 25, he says, Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. Since we're living by the Spirit, who, who, who is it that's living by the Spirit? Only those who have said yes to Jesus. I'm giving you my life, God. I've got to humble myself. God, I can't do it on my own. God, I tried it up there and back there so long. I'm so sick of that, God. God, I need Jesus. Jesus says, I love you. Jesus, I need you. But when a heart says, God, I'm sick of being in this crate, sick of being in this cave. I want freedom. I want freedom to, to go and be a blessing to other people. I want freedom to live the life that you tell me that you planned for me. I want freedom to fail and to struggle and to move forward and to become the person that I know you can make me to be. God says, that's all I want from you. I want your heart. And when a person says those things to Jesus, Jesus, here's my life. I give it to you. When we let go of our life, He fills us with the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit changes everything.